Welcome to CXO Unplugged. My name is Brad Howarth and with me today we have Emmanuel Purtis. Emmanuel is the Managing Director of Napoleon Purtis, Australia's largest makeup company. So welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, I've said largest and let me just qualify that a little bit. I think you've revenue of $80 million, yes. 50 stores, uh, 35 counters and, and covered in stockists um, about 650 salons around Australia. That's a big effort in a very crowded marketplace for an Australian company. Tell me a little bit about maybe how you got started though and uh, the journey that's taken you to, to get here. It's pretty much been an odyssey. Um, we started the three of us uh, more than 15 years ago. We actually, um, to add to that, was that we actually also have the world's largest makeup academy. Mm -hmm. And the brand started off as a makeup academy and we felt that there was a very strong niche in the Australian market for a makeup artist brand. And back then, you know, other competitors like Mac and Schumer, and they were no, non-existent. They, they weren't to come to Australia for quite a while. Right. So we saw an amazing opportunity for a makeup artist brand of the kind and we quickly uh, secured funds through family uh, financing and just our, our own running around and getting credit card debt to right up here mm -hmm. and um, we thought you know this is the time for us and Napoleon Purtis who's also my brother he was obviously the, the makeup artist the creative visionary and to successfully create a makeup artist brand we needed a figurehead so we opened our first concept store in Paddington right. um, in 1995 so very soon not 9-11 but 9-9 <laughs> and um, we basically start off with Paddington and then the brand pretty much caught on in the sense of the attention of department store buyers from even as far as Western Australia and in Maya back then which was called Grace Brothers and they kind of like saw its innovativeness because back then most women uh, on the cosmetics floor used to apply makeup with cotton tips and cotton balls and they lacked that sense of innovation of brushes and the kind of formulation technologies that makeup artist brands are very well renowned with mm -hmm. and I must say we, we built the brand yes from in the way a bootstrap bootstrap kind of company yeah but it kind of like was led predominantly with product quality innovation and that was really the the ground base that we actually were operating from because it allowed us to win incredible amount of praise from the media back then we didn't have a marketing budget it was very much PR driven so your product had to really be great and your story had to be really interesting so yeah, that's how we started because you've actually been working together yourself your brother and your uh, your sister-in-law yes. Sula Marie for 25 years now I think well it's basically we've been in business because before that we actually had an ad agency together mm -hmm. um, and we started off I, we graduated and he was she was in finance uh, she was finishing off her actuarial studies so she's quite a mathematical genius that way and Napoleon Purtis was in his advertising career and I had finished graduated uni and we kind of like thought that an advertising agency would be fantastic and we started off with an advertising agency servicing retail mid-tier clients and it was getting quite good but Napoleon had a very and we enjoyed working with each other as as turbulent as family can be you know you, but with the you know tough times come the great times and there's obviously has to have been far more great times than any mm. anything else and we felt that we were uh, you know there was a, a quite a strong dynamic between us and the way we operate and the complementarity would have to be one of the most quintessential aspects to our success the fact that Napoleon with his creative visionary um, excellence and his entrepreneurial drive Sulamari with her financial um, numbers and stock and myself with operational business and overall marketing so there was a really amazing just you know jigsaw puzzle kind of fit that we had and it allowed us and one of the mysteries of you know our enterprise is it allowed us to not tread on each other's toes because we had our own niche carved out and we trusted each other impeccably right and I guess that that's one of the bonds you can get through family but holding it together for that period of time has it ever been difficult for you to, to stay that close? Look, it has been difficult. I mean, we're in our mid we're actually in our late 30s. <laughs> we're in our late 30s now and, you know, I think in your early 20s and mid 20s when you have a lot of blood rushing to the head and hormones and, you know, a lot of testosterone as a 20, mid 20s year old man, you know, we, there, there have been a fair share of clashes but um, not to sound corny, but there was love and there was a lot of family love. I mean, Napoleon, myself, grew up in the same bedroom our whole lives because we, we had lived with our grandmothers and so we shared a small confined space at a Parramatta, a three-bedroom house 
for most of our lives. So we were used to each other's nicks and knacks and we bounced, we had a, we both have a very enormous resilience to bounce back from arguments and you know, and, and there's a degree of refreshingness with being able to be that brutally honest with each other. Probably quite handy as well when you're bootstrapping a company and sharing hotel rooms to keep the cost down. <laughs> yes it is, it's very, <laughs> it is very handy and I remember our trip to Los Angeles when we were sourcing uh, material which was a bit odd but we, we shared a one bedroom. Napoleon and his wife had the double bedroom and I had my single and we had to take turns using the bathroom and we had to take turns when we would actually get rest and we couldn't afford anything more. We, we were sourcing product for our new business and it was we, we were on actually a, a, a tight, very tight budget. Because of course now you are making a very big push into the US. Napoleon's I think living over there now. Um, tell me a little bit about that strategy because I understand you, you're doing some interesting things in terms of uh, working with celebrities there, getting a, a reality TV show up and off the ground. Yes. What have been some of the things you've done that are really paying off for you now? Look, America's timing was quite amazing in that the brand had just turned 10 years old when Napoleon moved over there. We had reached a level of maturity in Australia that we were able to fund and support the American venture forward. Um, it has been very challenging at times because it's an incredibly tough market to crack. Um, and I would, would I say we've cracked it yet? Probably not, but we've made incredible inroads with regards to strategic relationships with brands like Sephora and Saks Fifth Avenue. These are iconic American brands, mm -hmm. and as well as Ulta, and with regards to, we've recently launched a diffusion line into Target, which is over 1,600 stores, and Target has a very chic reputation over in the States, where both the rich and the poor alike shop there, because it's such a destination for you know designer brands. So I guess we've made the right moves in terms of the kinds of partnerships we forged and just at the right time with the economic meltdown in the States we had a very good strategic partnership of retailers that was able to keep us afloat. Okay, Has that economic meltdown hurt you though either here or there? I mean you, you mentioned that it's, it's not really ideal to be in retail perhaps at that time but how have you managed to get through that? Look, um, America has been um, an incredible challenge in terms of you see you sow a seed and it grows and mm -hmm. actually, you know, um, flowers quite and blossoms quite beautifully, but there is just so much ground to cover. So it has been hurtful in the sense of just when we were accelerating, uh, it did put a dampen on things. Um, however, the Australian business has been able to very successfully fund that, support that, mm -hmm. drive it and you know, be there for it. So when in terms of resources, both, you know, key peoples and we've been able to really expatriate amazing talent over there to keep the engine running and keep the innovation happening over there. So it has been challenging, but I think the strength of the Australian operation with Napoleon's kudos and kind of acumen over there and his team over there, it's been amazing. Um, I know there'd be a lot of people who disagree with this, but you could probably say that cosmetics might be considered a discretionary purchase as opposed to an essential one. And I know not everyone would agree with that, but so how have you managed to, to maintain the success of the brand through the current economic crisis? Because one of the first things you think what people might do is start to cut back in those areas. True. Um, the, the, the fact is that with makeup today, um, it, it is no longer discretionary. It's actually not even a luxury. It's, it's a staple. There's hardly any um, women out there that would walk out of the house without their face on. As they say, um, makeup, uh, mascara, these are fundamental essentials now as much as it is with their clothes that they wear and the hair that they wear. So mm -hmm. it, it has become a necessity to everyday modern living. Um, with regards to it forging, you know, a, a key basis for the success of our, I guess, company throughout these difficult times, I would have to say that it, it, being no longer discretionary spend, but a necessity has helped a lot. Mm -hmm. The lipstick index really should be called a foundation index because yes, discretionary spending on cosmetics does slow down, but it doesn't retract. It's just you, just the, the, the nip of the buoyancy has been taken out. Right. It's where you had that buoyant, you know, early 2000s growth, it kind of like has just deflated a bit. And so therefore where you're growing normally 23, 30% a year, you're probably growing around eight to 15, mm -hmm. which is a realistic and manageable growth sometimes too. Okay, now we're coming through hopefully the worst of the economic crisis at the moment. It sounds like the US is, is ready to, to ramp up. What about the rest of the world? I mean, is, is Paris somewhere you're aspiring to get to the rest of Europe? 
It's interesting you should say that because we were just talking about the other day with Napoleon and we really want to focus on the Pacific at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Europe is quite far away yet. It is a very strongly regulated environment. It's a very strongly protected environment and it is as fiercely as competitive as the United States. A lot of the famous brands in cosmetics like Chanel and Dior are European origin uh, and L'Oreal and Lancôme. So you have a very fierce climate, but America still is the beacon when it comes to innovation and cosmetics. And should we be successful, and I believe we will be, in conquering America, you will have the Europeans, the Asians, the Latin Americans marching and knocking on your doorsteps to take on your products. So people are looking at our success and they're looking at how we're coping and how we're growing in the United States and they're really closely watching to see that, is this a brand? Because if it can make it there, it can make it anywhere. Mm -hmm. You talked um, when you got started, you were quite innovative in terms of looking at different ways of bringing products into the market and, and, and moving beyond the, uh, the standard yes. uh, application of the David Jones store. Um, in terms of the, how the market stands today though, where do you think you stand out and how do you differentiate yourself in what is an incredibly crowded market now? It is crowded. I, I think one of the key things is to really f go with your um, instinct because if you're constantly looking over your shoulder seeing what the others are doing you will get distracted and you'll eventually stumble we, we really have an enormous we've managed to secure enormous talent in terms of trend forecasting in terms of understanding where direction is moving and we have a very acute touch as to where what the consumer wants and what the female wants so we, we go with our instinct and I think that is what's quite unique about the brand. Um, yes, sometimes we are first to market, sometimes we're second, but you know, we always make sure we're best to market and that's what our key focus is. Um, our innovation really rests on a number of different aspects, both with product but also with format. Um, one of our key formats is where a lot of other brands have not managed to be successful is at the stockists. Salon, pharmacy, there hasn't been an Australian brand for you know, decades that really have captured the heartland of Australia down at the local beauty salon or hair salon. And we've been able to be successful in our, and innovative in our format, in our business model and method. So innovation doesn't always just happen at the product level, it happens in culture, it happens in format and method as well. Brilliant. Emmanuel Purtis, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.